and that is on the hour. Good evening, good day, good morning, wherever you are in the world. And thank you very much indeed for joining the Black Belt Academy for Surgical Skills. If you're returning, thank you. And if this is your first time, welcome. My name is David O'Regan. I'm a cardiac surgeon in Yorkshire in the United Kingdom, and I'm the director of the Faculty of Surgical Trainers for the Royal College of Surgeons of Edinburgh. The Black Belt Academy is set up to help you practice at home and give you tips and tricks to enable you to better your surgery and start your journey towards mastery and becoming an expert. Welcome your feedback, your thoughts and ideas. And I'd like to say a particular thank you again to Virtual Medical Educations for allowing us to share their platform and welcome Surgical UK. One of the tweets that touched me during the week is, was from Raju Eswarand, who's an orthopedic surgeon in New Delhi. He's been practicing for 17 years and said that last week's lesson taught him something. What I like about it is one is the compliment, which is thank you very much, Raju. But second and more importantly, even as an orthopedic surgeon of 17 years, he was learning and practicing. And he shared the video with his trainees. So last weekend, I was training in the dojo in karate. And it just so happened on the Saturday that all the students were black belts or higher grades. And the exercise set by the sensei was to music. You had to do the katas, which are the set forms and movements from your first cue to your 10th. So from white belt to black belt, you had to do them forwards twice and backwards in time to the music, within the music time and to finish off the song, do exercises. And you have to do the cartons as quickly as you can. What was interesting and what is stressed by that exercise is that when you are tired, worn out, or under stress, your thinking goes awry. And this exercise was to push us to the limits to ensure that we remembered the basic cartons and movements, which are all part of muscle memory. In that respect, I think of it as thinking under critical pressure. And the lesson this evening on stitching is to give you a framework to set yourself up to stitch the perfect stitch, no matter how tired, weary, or how stressed you are. This is what I call the thinking critically under pressure or teacup of surgical stitching. I've also enjoyed reading this book called Expert, written by Professor Roger Kneeburn, who is a professor of surgical education and Imperial, and I've now had the privilege of working with on the Masters in Surgical Education program. But what resonated with me is the stories about a tailor and a sculpture. The tailor spent hours and hours and hours sewing on pockets wondering if he was getting better. And quite frankly, in his own words, was getting bored with doing it until he decided to be, in his own words, present in his work and concentrated on it fully. This is what deliberate practice is. And with that, he became familiar with his materials and developed very quickly into an expert tailor. Similarly, Paul, who is a sculptor, was not allowed to progress until he could perfect the perfect horizontal and perfect vertical face on a piece of stone. I actually worry with training today and obviously with COVID and not being at home, we're not addressing that repetitive nature and muscle memory of gaining skills. And that is why uh, I introduced the Black Belt Academy of Surgical Skills 
and the philosophy. So let us move on to Stitchin. And you will note that on Facebook and on Twitter, I was extremely pleased to see source a new ironing board this week. And you would think, why is the surgeon so excited about an ironing board? It was because the height of this ironing board goes from 75 centimeters to 95 centimeters. So in other words, I can set it up perfectly to maximize the functional anatomy of my upper arm. Now I've covered that before. And unless your upper arm and wrist and it's a bit like Thunderbird's puppets. Shoulders relaxed, elbows slightly extended, hands palmer flexed, that you will get the best out of your instruments and the best out of the movement of your upper arm. And the exercise this evening is all around angles and geometry. And I'll explain why. So if you hold on to your seats, I am actually going to go now to the overhead cam, here we go, and ask you a simple question. What I have on this plate is a whole series of needles. From a sternal needle, 3 0 and you might not be able to see it, a 7 -0. What is in common with all of these needles. The first thing to recognize that all needles are actually made on a circle. So their travel through the tissue has to be on a circle. And the reason why it has to be on a circle, because if you take the radius like that, at every point along the radius, The tangent is at 90 degrees at every point. And I'll put it to you that 90 degrees is the perfect angle. And Muhammad, who is working with me, did a fantastic study that drew out angles from 96 to 84 degrees with two 90 degrees in it and asked people to identify 90 degrees. And everybody was able to identify that 90 degrees, which is the tangent to the radius of every part of the circle. And why 90 degrees I think is important is because we are all hardwired to recognize 90 degrees. If you look at a window frame or look at a door, or even look at that, if it wasn't a perfect 90 degrees, You wouldn't recognize it. So if I actually put that off slightly, there you go. Immediately, you can see that is nine, not 90 degrees there quite easily, but that is 90 degrees there. And we are hardwired. And why this is important? Because at every point along the circle, at every point, if I take a tangential slice, I should see the passage of the needle through the tissue circumscribes a perfect circle, all right? Like that, it should be a perfect circle. And within that circle, the suture sits with no space at all. But you can imagine if at any point of drawing that circle, you are clumsy in the rotation of your needle, what actually happens, you end up, as we have here, an elliptical hole. And you put that elliptical hole in there and you put the suture in like this. And that's the suture. What have you got? You've got a space. And that space is problematic. And as a cardiac surgeon, that space is a sweating anastomosis. In a vascular surgeon, you'll see it as a spurting bleed. But even if you are a GI surgeon, that space is a potential microabscess that is going to compromise the healing of your bowel anastomosis. So 
attention to detail is vitally important. So before we go on to explain how to achieve 90 degrees and the perfect angle, we need to under understand the anatomy of the needle. This end is the sharp end. And this end is the swage that actually holds the suture. And the working body of your needle is this area here. And you should mount the needle just beyond the halfway. You can get precision by mounting it closer, but you lose control by mounting it further back. So how do we achieve that 90 degrees? Well, the important thing to remember is that all too often, a needle is presented to you like that, okay? At 90 degrees to the needle holder. And that would work perfectly if your wrist and elbow were at the same level. But they're not. We are standing up. Remember, we're standing at something akin to a counter. And also, we are operating at depth. And as I've pointed out before, as soon as you do that, the important thing is to angle the needle out. And this angle here is effectively the angle between the 90 degrees and lowering your forearm there. So it's better. See that angle? It's effectively that angle there. And when mounting the needle, before you even start to stitch, you need to mount it correctly. Attending to the anatomy of the needle, just beyond the halfway, and angling it out, but more importantly, ensuring that you're in the sweet spot of the needle holder, that there's no space between the tip of the needle holder and the shaft. And one way to do this is place it on the palp of your finger and bring the needle holder in at an angle like that. And therefore, you'll always have it on the tip and you'll have it at the right angle. Okay? So, the whole of stitching is to ensure that you align the needle properly, that the 90 degrees is upheld no matter where you are stitching. And therefore, what dictates how good your stitching is, is very simply the alignment of the needle. Now, before we do that, to achieve the perfect rotation without the end of the needle wobbling around as we move it, would not recommend putting your fingers through the loops of the needle. Many people would actually stick your DIP joint through the loops of the needle holder. But that would be dangerous, should somebody try and remove it from you, but also takes away from what I've previously said are the important feel and sensory areas of your hand. So the new way to practice holding your needle, and it's the first step to your mastery of stitching, is to hold the needle holder in what I would call a benediction sign. That is, placing the needle holder along the line of axis of rotation, which is between the index finger and the middle finger and your common flexor origin at the elbow. And pronation and supination is simply the folding of the radius over the ulna around that axis. And by holding the needle on that axis, the point of the needle is not going to rotate around. But the other important thing is in doing this, your index finger is down the needle holder. And you can see I'm feeling the needle holder. The palp of my fourth finger and my fifth finger are wrapped lightly around. Now you would ask yourself, how on earth do I take the needle on and take the needle off in this circumstance? And this is what practice is required. We'll come back to the intrinsic muscle of the hands, this beautiful muscle of pronins, 
arising from the flexor retinaculum and inserting into the lateral border of the first metatarsal. And what that muscle does effectually is pull the first metatarsal across the hand and rotates the thumb slightly across that way. But as pulling it across the hand like that is the action to actually lock and unlock the needle holder. There you go, lock and unlock. This will take some practice if you've never done it before. And I'd recommend that you get a needle holder, pop it in your pocket and practice. When I see training surgeons in the corridor who've been through the class, and I hope they've got a needle holder in their pocket, I ask them, how are you today? And I hope to hear a lovely chirping sound as they confirm that they've been practicing how to hold the needle holder. It is awkward at first, it does require practice, but does ensure the perfect rotation. So, the exercise to practice your needle rotation is to take a baked potato, microwave it. This is a health and safety warning because microwave baked potatoes are jolly hot. So make sure it's cooled down. I don't want people complaining they've burnt themselves and put it in a pudding basin. And you put it in a pudding basin at depth. Now, 90 degrees is your alignment in all directions. It's 90 degrees to the tissue, like that. It's 90 degrees across what you want to stitch, like that. So the first point of your thinking critically under pressure and your first teacup instruction is place. Place the needle down and ensure that your alignment is perfect in the horizontal plane and in the sagittal plane like that in 90 degrees. Your next important thing to do is to rotate the needle backwards like that and you point there, point into what you want to stitch. So place, point. And there's a little trick, and you've probably heard me do it as I did that automatically. As I'm rotating back, I've used my opponent's policies to undo the stitch. I'm now pointing exactly where I want to stitch. And what I'm going to do is rotate this big needle through the potato using the length of the needle and take it out. Now, it didn't come out quite as 90 degrees as I'd like, but what the needle is showing you, it is held by the tissue. I do not need to bring the forceps in to deliver this needle. And in delivering the needle, I need to bring it out iteratively, maintaining that 90 degrees to the tissue, deliver it on the rotation all the way, lock the needle and do it again. Now you notice in doing that, I've lost the angle. And when you're learning to stitch, that often happens that you do the first stitch and you lost the angle. And before you stitch again, go back to the, is it at the tip? Is it angled out? And when you take it down and place it, is it 90 degrees across what you want to stitch? And does the body of the needle bounce on the surface, on the belly? So let's do that again across what we want to stitch, I'm rotating it back, pointing into what we want to stitch, and in doing so, I have unlocked the needle, and I'll try again, and I'm going to deliver this needle through the potato, and I'm now on the other side. But the important thing is, in taking the needle out and putting it in, I am not tearing the potato and not mushing it. Because if I'm clumsy in this rotation, I'll do it and I'll do it fast. I'm clumsy in the rotation and I pull it out and skew it out. You can see the skin of the potato is torn. What I like about this potato exercise is the fact that it gives you five surfaces to practice on. This surface, the surface away from you, the surface towards you, the surface to your left and the surface to your right. And to actually get 
those surfaces. It's important to work out yourself how you stand in the position of your arm. So I'll give you the most tricky example is the area next to me. And this area is not too dissimilar to what's called the angle of Sorum in closing the aorta after an aortic valve replacement. To get that angle, I place my needle 90 degrees across what I want to stitch. I've sort of flattened the angle a little bit because I brought my elbow in the air in line with my wrist. So therefore the angle that I is now more towards the 90 degrees. I rotate back again and I rotate forward and I take it out. And I dragged it out and there's an example of how the skin tears. So the geometry of the needle dictates how you carry the needle through the tissue. The baked potato exercise is difficult and it's meant to be difficult because there's no point practicing on something that is easy, but more importantly, doesn't give you feedback when you do it wrong. We'll continue this exercise in another session where we focus on the moves to ensure that you get the right angle each time with a non-dominant hand behind the back. But next time, we're going to actually look at swapping from forehand to backhand, ensuring that you're keeping the rotation, but your left hand and forceps are not deviating the needle and tearing the tissue. This has of clinical importance. And it's of clinical importance, particularly in cardiac surgery, or all surgery, when dealing with dissected tissue that is wet and soggy, a bit like blotting paper. You cannot afford to take a needle through anything but perfectly. Likewise, our ophthalmic surgeons recognize this with corneal transplants. If their radial sutures were perfectly radial, uh, not 90 degrees to the cornea, you can imagine this transluminous cornea crumpling because of bad stitching. And the end result is blurring of vision. It is important. This is a simple exercise you can do at home to practice. I hope it has made sense to you. I'd invite comments and observations. I wish you well wherever you are in the world. I'll ask that next week, forgive me, I'm going to the course at the college on non-technical skills in surgery, which is as important as technical skills. So I will return in two weeks and look forward to seeing you then. Thank you very much indeed for joining me in the Black Belt Academy of Surgical Skills. Good day, good night, good morning and be safe wherever you are. Thank you.